Himalaya Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello, welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, being mindful about what we eat comes with lots and lots of health benefits, and knowing where our food comes from is a really big part of that. Have you ever considered growing your own food and worried it'll take too much time and maybe not pay off? But my guest today, I think, will change your mind. I'm delighted to be joined by the founder of GIY, Michael Kelly, whose new book, The GIY Diaries, A Year of Growing and Cooking, will help you learn how to create a space that gives you fresh, wholesome fruit and veg that tastes far better than anything you can find in the shops. Michael, a very big welcome to the show. How's it going? I'm great. How are you doing, Carl? I'm looking forward to this. I'm one of those people who kind of, geez, I'd love to do that. And I'd love to grow that. And the extent of my growing is mint and chives that I'm very proud of, but like they're both unkillable as plants, basically. So I can't take too much pride in it. Um, yeah, so, mint in particular, it's a bit of a <laughs> kind of a weed. Uh, but it just takes over everything. And I learned that the, the hard way. But however, listen, let's get oh, stuck into it. For listeners who mightn't be aware, what is GIY? Uh, so GIY is uh, a social enterprise. We started back in 2008 and basically we try and help people to grow their own food. Um, that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, around a million people took part in one of our programs last year across, across Ireland and the UK. So we're, we're just all about getting people to grow some food. Um, we feel it's like, it's like the ultimate gateway drug into a whole range of really sustainable food behaviours. Uh, so when people grow their own food, they kind of they tend to um, they tend to sort of do lots of other stuff over time as well because they're sort of starting to understand where their food comes from and learn a bit more about it. They they tend to kind of eat more plants and waste less food and buy more local food and buy more organic food and so on. So it's just a sort of a like a pathway into a whole load of other uh, more sustainable food behaviors. Um, so it's yeah, that's that's effectively what we do. And, you know, I suppose it's probably perceived as being kind of scary and kind of difficult. Is that a false perception? Um, yeah, to a degree it is. It Like, it's, it is and it isn't, if that makes sense. Like, it, it kind of definitely, when I started off, I remember that feeling of being really daunted by it and, like, not having a clue where to start. And I was I was kind of an IT nerd uh, by in the day job. And I remember, like, setting up a spreadsheet. Um, this is about 20 years ago, like, and, and having you know, all of the veg down one side uh, of the spreadsheet and all of the months across the top. And like, Oh, this sounds like something I would, you know, I love a good spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as anyone who knows me will tell you. <laughs> exactly. Uh, if in doubt, start a spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> but like, because there, there is a lot to learn. Like, funnily enough, you, you kind of, I kind of assumed in my naivety that, you know, all, all, all veg kind of would grow in a similar way and at similar times of the year, but they're all different. Like, so if there's like, 30 or 40 veg that you might want to try growing each of them has a different way of growing and a different time of the year when they grow and so on so it's like you know that side of it there's a lot to figure out and and I always kind of in hindsight I wish I'd cut myself some slack actually and just sort of gone with the fact that like any life skill that's worth having it takes some time to sort of get good at it and um, but at but at a, at a basic level actually it's very straightforward like there's you stick a seed in the ground if it's a leak seed, it knows how to become a leak. You don't have to whisper any <laughs> instructions into its ear. Um, and, and basically, you sow a seed, it turns into a plant that becomes something you eat. Like, that's the basics of it. There's a whole ecosystem of knowledge around that that you have to try and figure out in time. But even in the first year, when I hadn't a clue what I was doing, I was, I was still able to produce lots of food we could eat. So I think that's the... That's the message. It, it's there's lots to figure out, but at a basic level, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the, there's a fairly steep learning curve by the sounds of it. But in the same boat, you'll have some kind of success. And I suppose that's the initial. It's the feel good factor from growing your first vegetable or your first, you know, that that, that first time you get it that you get it right, the first time that it, you take it out and you cook it and you go through the process. That that fuels your 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 optimism to keep going. Yeah, exactly. Like in, it's it's very similar to an exercise that the the kind of runner's high is is what keeps you coming back when when it's when things are tough and whatever. And it's it's similar. Like you get, I always feel I I get a real kick out of seed sowing itself. Like because it's a very mindful activity, as you said, um, kind of gets you out of your head and into your hands. It's a lovely tactile kind of you know dexterous kind of a process with your hands. 
Um, and then I get a kick out of seeing something germinating. Like I, I always still, even 20 years later, I still get a buzz from seeing little seedling emerge in the soil. And then obviously you get the buzz from eating the stuff <laughs> later on. Um, so I think it's that it's that enjoyment and that sense of kind of empowerment and, and all, of, all of the sort of mental health benefits that create that bit of stickiness from day one that kind of keeps you coming back through all of the, there's always challenges. I mean, even, even this year, I'm I'm getting getting good at it now, and I'm 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 um, twenty years on. I'm sort of I'm I'm my knowledge is is fairly good, but there's still always challenges in any given year because on on top of the sort of the basic template of how to grow and when to sow things and all of that, there's then all of the other factors that come in. So your your busy life, your you know the weather, the climate, um, pests and diseases coming in to 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 make them making balls of things on you and so on so it's like there's lots of things that can go wrong and still do and that's part of the enjoyment no no two years the same it's always it's always very diverse you know and for someone starting out or someone listening in who's thinking geez i wouldn't mind a bit of that now talk to me about how time consuming it is how much time does it take well it's as time consuming as you want it to be let's put it that way like and i would always say to people you need you need to make it fit your own lifestyle and and um you know, I, I kind of, again, I've got better at that over the years. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very efficient at it now. Like I focus on the things that I know work for me. Um, I, I, I focus on the things that we like to eat as a family. Um, and, and I'm not as experimental as I used to be, I suppose. I, I started off wanting to grow everything. I was like, you know, Willy Wonka's chocolate factory kind of a vibe, you know, whereas now I'm like. What, what's, the hard, to- what's the hardest thing to grow? Or what's the hardest thing you've tried to grow? Um, like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's a, there's a sort of a family of veg called brassicas, which is basically all of the, all of the cabbages, um, cauliflowers, kales, all that kind of stuff. And, and they're very, they're very prone to pests. So, so, um, there's a thing called the cabbage white butterfly, which flies around. It's all lovely and dainty and beautiful in your veg patch, but it's, it's wreaking absolute havoc. <laughs> uh, it lands and lay, lays its eggs on the leaves. The, le- the eggs turn into caterpillars. The caterpillars munch the plants. So it's, it, that whole family is very, um, it's very just prone to, to pests in a way that others aren't. Like beetroot, for example, brilliant veg to grow. Really, really good for you, obviously. Um, very almost 100% reliable like it never it never succumbs to any problems really really good value for space so in a in a small raised bed say maybe a meter or two meters squared you could probably grow 40 or 50 beetroot um wow and and stores really well so you can store it in a box in the garage or whatever as well so <clears throat> some things are really simple whereas there's other veg that are that little bit harder and and as I said, you just need to give yourself a bit of a pass on those that sometimes they'll work and sometimes they won't, you know? Okay, so beetroots are going. I'm sold on the beetroot now. I'm going to put down my little list of things that I'm going to try in a couple of weeks. Um, is it expensive to do as a hobby? So like to get started and get, and get off the ground, is the ra- presumably the raised bed is, where, is your go-to to start with? Yeah, raised beds are kind of a go-to for people because they're, they just make it a little bit more straightforward. Like, for most suburban back gardens, which I suppose is probably where the majority of, of Irish people live, um, the soil in your back garden typically isn't brilliant because what happens is the builder, like after the housing estate or whatever was built, the builders move in and they put in a small shallow layer of topsoil on top of the builders, builders rubble or whatever. Um, so generally speaking, the soil isn't brilliant. Like any, any vegetable appreciates about a spade's depth of decent quality soil, you know. Um, there are some exceptions to that, like things that need it, will be happy with a bit shallower. But by and large, you need about that. Um, if you're lucky enough to have that in your back garden, you don't need a raised bed. You can just you can grow directly into the into the soil. But for most people, raised beds are a really good, a really good way to start. And okay, so so that's the real. That's one. That's one. Like one of the reasons for the raised beds. Then is the it's just getting really good quality soil. And I always wondered why people like they look lovely. I've seen Peter O'Mahony. He has these big wrought iron ones. They're they're, they're yeah, deadly yeah. looking. Um, but it is for you put really good quality soil into it, and that's the, that's one of the reasons for having it. Ex- exactly. Effectively, you're building up a layer of topsoil on top of your grass or whatever whatever you're putting it onto and so you, you can it really means you can you can start the next day um 
and you know raised beds don't have to be expensive if you're any way handy you can knock them up um it's it, all it is effectively is a wooden frame you know that sits on top of this of the grass and then you fill that with with topsoil and and you're good to go you know the next day or that day like the they're a brilliant way to sort of get started so you can do that really cheaply it, it doesn't need to cost anything at all or you know you can buy raised beds in garden centers and spend a few bob on it if you want but again i think i think one of the big motivators for people at the moment we're seeing it, this a surge in interest in in growing and i think it's coming down to the cost of living uh, crisis that um, you know, five, six hundred euros of, of vegetables, I think, is very achievable for even a, even a beginner grower. Um, and on our website, we've loads of free courses where people can go and kind of learn how to get started. Um, so th so that kind of saving is very significant for people on top of all the other benefits of, of sort of, you know, being involved in, in growing the mental health benefits and, and accessing this, you know, delicious food. Again, I think. Carl, to me, that's probably the biggest, the biggest motivator, the biggest kind of stickiness for people is that when you taste this food, you realize it tastes different to, to some of the some of the veg you'd buy. And I've always been really curious, like, why is that? Like, why would it taste so different? And I think it's a combination of a couple of things. It's 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 peak freshness. So you're 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 literally picking so picking vegetables out of the soil and maybe cooking with them straight away or eating them raw or whatever. And um, so you're accessing food that's like bursting with nutrition and we know scientifically vegetables change when you take them off the plant they start to die effectively because they've been removed from the plant um, and that happens gradually in some cases but you know I, I always feel if it doesn't sound too too um too sort of odd uh, or or too arsy to say but I, I can always sort of taste the life force in food now like you, you can really taste it like um, and and so I think I think that sort of peak freshness leads to a deliciousness that people sort of experience, and then they're like, Jesus, this this stuff tastes absolutely amazing as well as everything else, you know. Folks, you're listening to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. We're chatting all things GIY. So it tastes better. It's cheaper than what you're gonna what than what you're gonna buy in the supermarket. By the sounds of it, it's fairly straightforward. You get yourself a raised bed. You fill it with really good quality soil, and presumably you can get that soil from your local garden center. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's a, and there's companies out there that sell it in in kind of ton bags or whatever. But you can absolutely you can you can buy topsoil um, in garden centers to get started. Okay, great. And then the easy kind of go-tos are, so beetroot's one of them. Give us a few more people want to experiment. Yeah, well, okay. So I, I would always sort of say salad leaves are a great start as well. So there's there's a whole range of, <clears throat> of salad leaves called oriental greens. So they'd be things like rocket, mustard, you know, they're, they're kind of um, very easy to grow. They're practically indestructible, like they're... Um, you know, unlike lettuce, which can be a little bit more temperamental, so they're they're a brilliant one to start with. Definitely, some of the herbs you mentioned are great. Um, mint, I would say, put it in a pot. So that yes, it, it take takes over the everything, doesn't it? I learned that. And the second when we when we built our raised bed thing in our old house, we we put we put we, we basically potted it so that it couldn't, it couldn't go everywhere. Yeah, it takes no, everything that's over. That's a great idea. And then like some of the annual herbs, like basil and and. Uh, uh, coriander and dill and so on like they're all really really easy to grow and um, I suppose I would, I'd always include potatoes in the mix because like harvesting potatoes is always one of those kind of peak joy moments for for a grower I think and um, carrots a little bit trickier to grow but for, you know if you can get them right they're fantastic and um, uh, just great like again this visual feast I suppose where you're bringing out these orange carrots out of the brown soil it's amazing um, harvesting moment um garlic very easy to grow garlic's what i started with actually um back in the day and it's 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 something you actually can i ask you how, how does garlic it does is it above ground or below ground it's a very basic question but yeah no it's a great question it, and I, I was confused about that too actually <laughs> when i started because i think i think uh so you, you take a clove of garlic and stick it into the soil and over over a six month period the clove turns into a bulb underneath the ground uh, but there's a plant over the ground and so i was waiting for the bulb of garlic to form <laughs> up on top of that plant you know and i'm very disappointed when it wasn't working 
And it was only when I went to dig it out then thinking it was it hadn't worked that I found this lovely bulb of garlic under the soil. So that's how it works. And unusually, uh, garlic is sown at this time of the year. So so it's sown before Christmas and it's ready to eat then around June, June of next year. And again, stores really well. So you can hang it, you could have a, a braid of garlic hanging up in your kitchen and every every morning you can remind yourself how amazing you are then. Yeah. I've grown that. I am brilliant. <laughs> And to, like when you're writing a book, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of dedication. It takes a lot of kind of. There's a huge amount of work in a book. Um, presumably, you've you've written it because you see the market that's there. For there's an interest out there for, but you know, with the cost of living, but but also the, the big search for mindfulness and mindful things to do. And I, I I'm with you that the feeling of sticking your hand in the soil, whether it's digging something or lifting something or whatever. There is you can't really you can't take your phone with you to do all of that. You have to actually you know get hands on and have a mindful moment but presumably you really believe that there is you know a market out there for people who want to know the skills and the tools that they need and hence the reason for the book yeah it's a little bit of a perfect storm at the moment i think in in like so you have the cost of living crisis meeting a climate change crisis and a mental health crisis and i think you know growing kind of addresses all of those things you know and um so we've we've definitely in goi seen a huge a huge surge in interest at the moment and, and the book is really hopefully is kind of taking some of the some of the mystery out of it and trying to make it that bit more straightforward and it, and it kind of takes a load of a load of diaries and columns that I've written over the years and brings them into a, a kind of I suppose a one-year look at what the what it looks like so hopefully people I think I think some people will read it as a you know, as a book to read the whole way through. But I think people will also dip into it at different times of the year and see what they should be doing at that time of the year and what they should be should be cooking with because um, there's loads of recipes there from, you know, obviously growing the food is one, you know, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is you have to, you have to do something with it, particularly when you have, when you have a glut of, of produce that, that has to be, you know processed in some way you have to do something with it to save it for the for the winter or whatever so loads of recipes in there as well that hopefully help people to kind of um you know turn turn that produce into lovely meals which is ultimately what the whole thing is about of course and that whole seasonality has become quite trendy not only for you know as a kind of trendy but it's also very healthy in terms of you know from your gut bacteria your gut microbiome they need variation and they need new foods and different foods so by eating in that kind of seasonal way and and growing in that kind of seasonal way you're exposing your gut to new foods pretty much all the time you know month on month if you're trying to grow new stuff you're adding new foods back into your diet and providing that variation for your diet which is really important for that gut health component yeah exactly and just think like think about it this way that before the 1970s or 80s you know that's the way we ate like we ate what was in season um and then with the advent of supermarkets, we, we, you know, that, that all started to shift and it's got to a point where there are no seasons now in, in, in a supermarket, you can go in and you can get any food you want at any time of the year. And the way we tend to eat now is that we're recipe led. So we, we go, you know, we pick a, we pick a, 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 a cookbook off the shelf or we find something online and it really doesn't matter what season it is. And, and, and that's completely contrary to the way human beings have fed themselves for you know for since time began effectively um, and i think in doing that this kind of idea of a mono season which is what we have now is kind of i don't think it's a healthy way to eat i think what we're what we're doing is tuning out from the kind of wisdom that's in the season so there's like you know if you look around you at different times of the year you realize actually nature wants us to eat different things like in the spring you've got lots of you know, new shoots and, and greens coming in the summer. You've got, you know, vegetables that that hydrate us because our bodies need that. In the spring, in the autumn, you've got the, um, you know, the, the hedgerow full of full of vitamin C and berries and things that we need to get us geared up for the winter. And then in the winter, you've got the root crops. Like we go under the ground, we start eating earthy things like carrots and parsnips and so on. So there's a tremendous wisdom there that I think we've just we've tuned out from as a society. And I think it's, as you say, a really healthy way to eat if you can tune back into that. And by growing, I think you start to understand the seasons again and, and really, really plug back into that wisdom. 
And, you know, as part of society, society is very instant. Like we want things pretty much quickly. If someone's going to grow something, talk to me about something that's quite simple and quite quick in terms of a turnaround time from when you put it in the soil and when you actually see something spurting up out of the soil. Yeah, there's nothing really quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's slow food by definition. But <laughs> the, the, the quickest of the quick of the slow are um, probably like those salad leaves I was talking about. Oh, yeah. In the height of the summer, you're probably talking four to six weeks. Um, similar with things like radishes. Um, so they'd be about the quickest. I, I guess the average is probably maybe three to four months. And then there are some vegetables where you're working like tomatoes, for example. I'm absolutely obsessed with tomatoes. Like I bought like a three and a half grand a commercial polytunnel at home, um, which is like, you know, it's the kind of thing that farmers and, and uh, commercial growers have. I have one just for growing tomatoes because I love them so much, but you're working with tomatoes from, you know, sow the seeds in March, and I just literally this this weekend gone took the tomato plants out of the out of the tunnel. So you're working with them for almost ten months of the year. So um, you know, it's and it's everything on that spectrum from four to six weeks right up to ten months and and everything in between. But there's no, you know, I suppose there's no harm in that. There is a lesson in in that itself, which is, you know, it is okay to slow down. And, and we're just we're we're so rapid as a society now that that, that pace of slowing things down is healthy and it's important and it's 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 really yeah. really good. And, you know, it's also an incredibly hopeful and optimistic uh, way to spend your time because, like, even I was thinking about this weekend, um, I went out to to sow garlic, right? So, uh, as I was saying, sow garlic this time of year to be ready next June. But, you know, I, I was trying to think about where to sow the garlic this year, um, you know, because you, you, you do a thing called crop rotation where you move you move everything around every year and plant it in a different place um, so that you don't get a buildup of, of kind of pests or diseases or anything like that. And so I was thinking about next year, you know, and so, so you're always looking forward, I think, with, with um, growing your own food. So that, and I think that's a really positive thing for your mental health that you're not, you know, you're, you're in the moment when you're doing it, but you're also forward looking and positive and optimistic about what's to come. And I think, we could all do a bit with a bit of that at the moment when the news around us is so so bad and dry and dim you know absolutely michael it's been great to chat to you today i've got beetroot uh, on my list and a few other things and i can't wait to read the book so a big thank you for joining me today michael's new book the GAY diaries a year of growing and cooking is available now in all good bookstores and online as well and michael if people want to follow you online where can they find you uh gry.ie or mick kelly grows on twitter absolutely fantastic okay great folks that is it for another episode of real health with me carl henry in association with layer health you know where we are at carl henry pt on instagram real health independent.ie if you liked what you've listened to don't forget to rate and review every single review means a huge amount we'll see you next week for more real health it's long full Leia healthcare looking after you always proud sponsors of real health with carl henry